Our next session is a panel discussion, Key Concepts in Antibiotic Therapy. We like to invite on stage our chairperson, Dr. Anand Shandilya, and our esteemed faculty, Dr. Sham Kukreja, Dr. Arun Shah, Dr. Chetan Trivedi, and Dr. K.K. Adoda. Dr. Anand Shandilya is an eminent pediatrician and infectious disease specialist from Mumbai. Dr. Sham Kukreja is a consultant pediatrician from Max Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Arun Shah is professor of pediatrics from Nepal. Dr. Chetan Trivedi is consultant pediatrician and infectious disease consultant from Ahmedabad. And Dr. K.K. Adora is a consultant pediatrician and infectious disease specialist. We invite all our faculty on stage. Over to Dr. Anand, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Thank you so much for those kind words, but I need a demotion. I am not an infectious disease specialist. I am a general pediatrician. So I am going to be speaking for the audience with these experts who are so eminent. So we are going to be discussing a few key concepts in antibiotic therapy. And uh, your experts have already been uh, introduced to you. You have legends on the stage, so we are going to make full use of them there. Uh, we know this is a common WhatsApp image which has been doing the rounds. We know this. And uh, so we go ahead and say that it's not an antibiotic deficiency state. And keeping this philosophy in mind, we are going to be discussing how we can limit the use of antibiotics and use them the best. Uh, we have a five-year-old boy with history of cough, a runny nose, low-grade fever since three days. He is well interfebrile. Now he complains of otalgia since one day. There is no past history of any ear infections. He is immunized till date. His vitals are stable. Chest is clear. There is some erythema of the right tympanic membrane. There are insignificant cervical nodes. And the question is for the audience. I hope your keypads are still active. Uh, we will not be giving a gift at the end of this session, but the reward will be uh, knowledge. So does this child need an antibiotic? This is for the audience. These are the three options. What? You want me to wait? Okay, so can, can I have a raise of hands at least, since not needed, okay. Uh, our experts, Chetan Bhai, can you start the ball rolling? What would your action be? Yes, sir. I think this is, uh, this looks like a normal viral infection which is causing autalgia. So maybe a upper respiratory infection causing autalgia. So, Antibiotics are needed only if it is a severe acute otitis media. This is non-severe, age is also five years. So uh, we can definitely, we, we should not give antibiotics in this patient, definitely. Yeah. Would you write a prescription for an antibiotic to the parent and say, report back to me if there is a problem, I may ask you to start it? Would you do that? Uh, I'm not sure, no, no. Rather, I would like to see the patient again. If a patient develops some complications or the persistence of symptoms more than three days, then I would like to examine the eardrum again and whether otoria is there. So I would like to re-examine the patient. Would you, Dr. Kukreja? See, uh, uh, don't write antibiotic prescription. I can tell you with this, uh, people being very friendly with antibiotics, they will start it. So <laughs> never write it. Okay. And uh, I think this is a child who looks like a viral infection by the history. And the child has got into otitis and mild otitis, if you uh, regularly see uh, ear in your practice, mild erythema does appear off and on and this is of no significance. But if the child becomes sicker, fever increases, pain increases, you call back, re-examine and if it is because of otitis media and you will see the obvious signs on the eardrum. And then you are justified in starting antibiotics. But this child, uh, more than 99% of the times, will not need antibiotics. Fantastic. Okay, I'll go on to the next course. This was just to get the ball rolling. This is a seven-year-old girl with cold and some cough since the last two days. She has a low-grade fever and myalgia since one day. She is totally well in the interfebrile period. Her throat is congested. Her vitals are stable. Chest is clear. All other systems are normal. 
they are again insignificant cervical lymph nodes and for the house will this work this time yes okay so same questions antibiotics needed not needed or will be needed later if symptoms evolve <coughs> are you voting Incidentally, Dr. Bapna, I was given 45 minutes for this session. Timing was 30, 40 minutes. Huh? So, 5 minutes you will have to give me at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Can we see the results? I am fighting for all of us, sir. Okay. So, antibiotics are not needed. Perfect. Uh, so, this, this session was to bring in deferred antibiotic practice. And the problem is most of us, general pediatricians, don't have a problem about seeing a patient on a daily basis also. We are more than willing to look at them. But suppose you are the type of person who sees patients only by appointment and you don't have time for that patient and the patient calls you, is it okay, sir, Dr. Kukreja, sir, to, for me to write an antibiotic for such a patient and say, you tell me what the symptoms are on the phone, I may start an antibiotic? Uh, mostly, um, uh, I have uh, patients in my clinic by appointments only. And uh, I prefer to see again rather than uh, giving a prescription like this. Okay. So because what happens, what happens, it's not the otitis. How the patient is evolving, how the illness is unfolding, that's more important for me than just that symptom, single symptom. Exactly. Okay. So when do you, Chetan Bhai, will you uh, pass the mic to Dr. Arora, sir? When do you practice deferred pra uh, antibiotic prescriptions? Now, in some cases, when the patient is living, say, far away, Patient if is far away. If patient okay. cannot report, say, maybe in a day or two. So, in those cases, patient coming from periphery and is educated. So, we can tell him about the warning signs. Sir, what is going to happen, say, if there is, say, there are, uh, uh, this fever is persisting or worsening. If uh, there, is, uh, there is an appearance of, uh, say, some swelling in neck, which is painful. So probably then he may start an antibiotic which is already written uh, after concerning, especially after concerning on the... Yeah, but I get time. the feeling from all of you that you are reluctant to write an antibiotic on your prescription for use later on. You would like to see the patient again, decide and then start. Is that what you are saying? I feel if you don't write it, what is going to happen is that there is a last prescription available with the patient, he will start himself. So yeah. I think it's better to review, that's much better. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would prefer, <coughs> uh, I would prefer that instead of the deferred antibiotic prescription, it should be deferred antibiotic counselling rather. That the patients should be communicated, counselled, and say that if the symptoms evolve or, or the worsening of the conditions, then patients should be brought. So patient should be taken into confidence instead of writing the antibiotic that he's, he should use. Most likely he, can, he may misuse the antibiotics. So Absolutely. So we are all very Sir. scared. I, yeah, I would like to make a point. In patient, this patient particularly, when we are saying, yes, we are sure it is a viral uh, tonsillitis or, you know, uh, upper respiratory infection, viral sore throat. But we are worried for only one thing, that is group A septococcal infection. Correct. If patient develops tender nodes and high-grade fever and most importantly, odinophagia, there is swallowing difficulty or painful uh, swallowing, then we might think that there can be a cause. So we might have to call him again and then examine the throat if it is an exudative. So we have to inform the patient that we are, we are worried for this also. Absolutely. So that and patient suppose, suppose this is a group beta hemolytic streptococcal pharyngitis, how long can we wait for us to start an antibiotic to prevent complications? Yeah, you can wait basically, but within say 7 to 10 days you have to start. Yeah, so waiting before, is not a problem. Yeah. Before 10 days, so yeah. waiting is not an issue. And uh, as far as waiting is concerned, uh, to avoid complications like rheumatic fever, okay, you can wait for nine days. But to avoid suppurative complications, you have to decide in next three, four days. But it's you would important. like to see the patient yes, again. Now, very often, uh, I don't know, there are two categories of patients. I call them, the first group is the one who says, Dr. Antibiotic to nahi likh rahe na. And the second group is, Dr. Antibiotic nahi likha. <laughs> so now, for those parents who say, Dr. Antibiotic to nahi likha, and you are not writing, what do you tell them that why you are not starting an antibiotic? I think uh, one of the statement which many of infectious disease specialists use in their practice and uh, uh, we always discuss on these forums is that always tell the patient, I am very happy that there is no need for antibiotics. I think this message goes more clearly in his head. I am happy that antibiotic is not required. 
So he should feel the doctor is very keen that I recover without antibiotics. Excellent. And I'm compelled to write antibiotics. And then I'm sorry, I have to write it because uh, your illness oh. is bacterial. Okay. So you actually apologize for writing an antibiotic. It's like Second thing, I think we should be convinced that we, there is no need for antibiotics in the particular case and that same thing you have to convince the patient that it is not required and even if the antibiotics been written, it is won't, won't change the symptomatology or any outcome. Absolutely. Rather it will add on the side effect and sometimes what we do is, uh, we have given, seen patient once, uh, once two months back, that time antibiotics not written, patient recovered. So we can say, ye yes, last time we saved this so antibiotic. So you use past experience to yes. convince them. And I think Dr. Shah has already told us what we should monitor and when the patient should, be re should report back to us. In other words, what is more important is counselling about when they should come back to us. That's most important. And I, I understand your reluctance to write an antibiotic. One, just sir, uh, one thing I would like to add, sir. More important is how the physicians uh, uh, look at the patients. Because more often we are guilty of the writing the prescription. It is not the patients otherwise. They do not insist upon. We, we can defer the prescription. Sir, come to Mumbai. <laughs> no, sir. I am doing a practice in a very remote area and yeah. still do not prescri prescribe antibiotics. Absolutely. You are right. So, so, there are two categories of patients. And what we wanted to say is offer a clinical assessment, including a history and physical examination to establish a diagnosis. Exclude complications for deferred therapy. For no antibiotic prescribing and delayed prescribing, offer patients reassurance that antibiotics are not needed and explain the warning signs and they should follow up if needed. And therefore, and I, I endorse the view that you may not write an antibiotic on paper because patients tend to misuse it. The next issue that we are going to be discussing is the route of administration of the drug. And often it is a very important route, an important issue with uh, parents. So this is a 10-year-old boy with high-grade fever since one week. He was sick interfebrile since three days. He's got an occasional cough and abdominal pain. He's now the story looks very f straightforward. It looks like he's probably coming down with an enteric fever. He has been provisionally diagnosed at and started on ceftriaxone after sending blood cultures. The child was afebrile two days after therapy. Intake was good. He was active and playful. Now for the audience, the father wants to go home on day three. He wants to go home on day three with his child, not alone. His blood culture is awaited. What will you advise on discharge? Cefexime, ceftriaxone, azithromycin, and the most popular combination of cefexime and azithromycin. Please vote now. Are you, why is the music not playing? Ah, oh, that's nice. Can we have the answers? Okay, so majority of the people feel that cefexime is the drug of choice in this case. Some of them feel that ceftriaxone also should be given. I am so happy to note that the nasty combination of cefexime and azithromycin has a very minor following. Incidentally, I have got to understand that this combination is the highest selling antibiotic combination in our country probably. So at least this audience is not going to be using it. So Dr. Uh, Arora sir, aap is pe zara comment karenge. what do you feel about this? I, will f I feel that if the patient has already improved, so now there is no need of continuing IV antibiotics. Oral antibiotic cefixim will do the job and, and that's uh, enough. What dose would and you like to use sir? I would like to use uh, 20 milligram per kg body weight okay. in two Excellent. divided doses. So the option is to use the least invasive form of therapy which will give a response. And here our culture is not ready yet. We have not yet got a blood culture report. We called up the lab, they said by tomorrow you will get it. Can we hold on or should we? No, we can give because there is a, clin uh, it clinical, was a clinical, response. clinical diagnosis and a clinical response is there. Okay, so fair enough. Now for the audience, what is the word OPAT stand for? I will give you the options also. OPD antimicrobial treatment, OPD advised treatment, outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy, and optional parenteral antibiotic therapy. 
can you please vote now music has started are you all voting excellent all of you know what the answer is and this scenario of a child with enteric fever who is responsive to ceftriaxone was brought in to introduce the concept of outpatient parental antimicrobial therapy because a lot of clinicians do practice this in our setting uh, dr chetan do you think this is the this can be done or there are this outpatient parental antimicrobial therapy is for some other situation i think practically what you said is correct people are using it and you can definitely opt for this if when blood culture report is available and somebody wants to wait for a day and he wants to continue antibiotics uh, uh, just making this opiate then definitely we can wait for a day or two but the thing is that we have to be very precise whether we want to continue antibiotics iv or not because opiate is outpatient parental antimicrobial therapy so you want to give the antibiotics that out of the hospitalization setting so maybe we have, we have discharged the patient and we give this therapy to the place which is safe and uh, where you can give this injectable maybe it is a outpatient department of some other practitioner who is nearby or is in a peripheral health center then you can definitely go for that and you can call the patient yeah but if you have a drug to which the child is responding orally you would probably not go for the parenteral therapy that's the first point now my question is then where where would you in your practice use parenteral antibiotic therapy on an outpatient basis see when you think that oral uh, conversion is not possible you need to give iv antibiotics say in case of say septic arthritis or soft tissue in infections where you need to give more uh, continuous iv antibiotics for a longer period of time and you don't want to keep the child child hospitalized and just Uh, get the cost increased and convenience is also problem convenience is also problem then you can go for this uh, opet so you are saying that a child who requires a prolonged course of antibiotic therapy but otherwise is hemodynamically and clinically stable who is just occupying a bed for the iv antibiotics are these situations dr kukreja you want yes, to yes i think uh, there are two three conditions where you can use this therapy number one is uh, it is to be used in a patient who is in the hospital and is in the on the hospital only for and an iv antibiotics and there's no other reason he should be in the hospital so this is number one criteria and number two criteria which is very important is are uh, the patient uh, progress has been such which indicates is unlikely to worsen at home that's number two and number three if there is no iv oral switch therapy available means i can't change over to oral then i should continue with opet rather than i i should make it iv to oral switch therapy okay fair enough and what about consent dr Sorry, arora yeah consent yeah. should always be there because uh, this yeah, something that's something which we have not been doing by yeah. and large so we should give and what exactly should be written in that consent we should explain patient th uh, thoroughly that uh, for treating this disease he needs to have a parenteral therapy and he should uh, have a person who can administer it even the parent should be willing to take the therapy so yeah. we we should have a written doc because legally also it is important Absolutely. because once you are uh, take, uh, taking a patient if he is not say you have written without informing is so then uh, liability is ours okay fair enough and i think dr kukreja has already told us child has to be hemodynamically stable and needing only iv therapy on outpatient basis is the situation now uh, how long will you we give antibiotics and what monitoring is required chetan bhai you want to answer that i think depending upon the diagnosis way which is the need of that opet so that is like suppose you have given for soft tissue infection and you want to can give can i give you examples would I, can i give outpatient parental antibiotic therapy for a condition like osteomyelitis yes you can give infective endocarditis no because infective endocarditis the child is stable and only requires 6 weeks of iv antibiotics it depends on if you are suspecting non enterococcal infection then you can otherwise because the chances of uh, complications are more in infective endocarditis suppose the child has an abscess which has been drained and we need to give iv antibiotics is that okay to give i think yes you can give it in abscess drained and if you need uh, iv antibiotics you can continue dr shah i, I think uh, uh, they need to be given parental 
antibiotic on the outpatient basis, provided ki there is a proper uh, understanding that well, uh, uh, that there is a proper clinical monitoring, the lab monitoring, or there is a clinical worsening of the conditions, and there is, must be access to the access to the uh, transport. I mean. Uh, they, 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 those factors need to be uh, understood. Okay, so from what we have discussed so far, you have told us which conditions this parental therapy is to be given. Mm -hmm. You have told us about how the child's condition should be there, uh, be before he is sent home on this. Third, there should be monitoring of the child by yes. a medical professional which has to be specified to them in, in writing so that they know what to do. And what are the risks? What what can go wrong with this parental therapy? Non ri risks are mainly the. It could be the uh, non-compliance. It could be infections. It could be blood clot formations there. So those are those things need to be addressed. And this, the and the medical the, the one who is a skilled staff should must understand when to when to just report to the hospital. Doctor Arora, which antibiotic should I choose if I have a choice? Suppose I have a child, I am sending him home. What are the criteria for choosing the antibiotic? We should choose an antibiotic where minimal doses are required. Preferably, say, a uh, OD dose or BD ah, dose. So, you are saying once a day or maybe maximum, maximum twice, twice a, day. a day. You can't have the patient coming yes. in every four hours. Yeah. Then he might as well stay in yeah. the hospital. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I think most effective antibiotics with least side effects and minimal dosage requirement per day. I think that makes perfect sense. Do I give it through a peripheral line or should I put a central catheter or a periphery place central, peripherally placed central catheter? That depends on the extent how much uh, you want to give. So if it's uh, really want to give for a pretty long period then a peripheral uh, catheter. Duration and the uh, type of injection mm -hmm. and uh, the patient's dynamics, fair enough. Now uh, what about newborns and children with meningitis, can I give them outpatient antibiotic therapy? Preferably not. No, that's because not in our setup. Yes or no? Uh, I'll uh, in meningitis. I'll be giving only after uh, say uh, uh, the patient is uh, hemodynamically and clinically well settled. Is already there with uh, uh, four, five, six days. And if uh, patient uh, they want to go, in that case, yeah, we can. Otherwise, okay. uh, preferably I will prefer not to. And new bed, new no, new nets. Dr. Kukreja, will you comment on this, please? Uh, many times, uh, regarding this, uh, uh, how many times antibiotics can be given, uh, there are a lot of service structures available in different parts of the world. For example, the patient, uh, uh, a nurse goes to the patient's home and gives the injection, or the patient comes to the OPD or to the emergency room or to the wards, pediatric ward, and takes the injection. And the third structure can be the local general practitioner can give the injections. And the last is, which Americans are very fond of, and that is the parents and the caregivers at home can also give the injections. And uh, uh, although there are no defined criteria, how to find out who are the good people who can really manage this. And these are the issues. And regarding your last question, uh, can I give it to the neonates? Many times it happens that you are treating a uh, child meningitis, which is gram negative. You have to give for injection for three weeks. Child is quite okay after two weeks, is accepting orally, is quite okay and is in the nursery just for the sake of injections. I'll send home and this. Remember in case of meningitis, the second child, most meningitis complications are up to three or four days. Hardly new complications arise in a patient who's really responding after five days. So five after five days, you can discharge a meningitis patient if he's hemodynamically stable, but if neurologically normal. If neurologically is abnormal, don't send him. We can have convulsions and all that. So in that situation, you may send after five days. So, uh, yeah, Chetan, and, and where we are uh, going for opet is important. If, suppose, I have admitted in nine, my nursery newborn for 10 days and it requires more 5 days of antibiotics. If I, if the person stays away from my hospital, then I can ask them to go to another hospital and get an injection that, uh, given. That way we can manage in yeah. case of newborn That also. is done pretty frequently also. Yes. See, because the, the burden of staying in the ICU only for antibiotics may be very heavy on the parents. See, Sir. It is very advantageous. Number one, it saves the cost. This yeah. is very important. Saves the cost of the uh, everyone. And second, the issue is uh, you are avoiding a hospital-acquired infection, which is a very big uh, advantage. Absolutely, in absolutely. I think uh, I won't go through the take-home messages because the messages have come very clearly. Uh, the 
next session, next part of this discussion is going to be, again, we talked about the correct route, but the problem is pediatricians have a major issue, in, especially in chubby babies, trying to get venous access. So we are going to talk about a scenario where we want to change over from, say, IV to oral. Uh, this is a three-year-old boy who came with high-grade fever, breathlessness and cough since two days. There was no past history. He was distressed. His air entry was decreased in the right middle zone. He was irritable. XRHS showed a consolidation. The count supported that. He was started on injection ceftriaxone. Tachypnea and saturations improved in two days. Child was taking orally. Fever was down and he was well interfebrile. So things have really worked out well for this child. Again, the parents want to go home on day three due to social reasons. They often give you this, ghar mein shadi hai, gaon jana hai, or something to the other. Means usually <coughs> an excuse to get out of the hospital. So now for the house, which antibiotic will you switch to? Cefixim, azithromycin, cefpodoxime, and ofloxacin and ornidazole. I am writing drugs which I see commonly in my clinic with the prescriptions which come to me. Perfect answer again. Nobody wants to, some people would like to write cefixime. Would, uh, uh, would Chetan Bhai, would you like to comment on that? Say here the patient is of pneumonitis and uh, we know one dictum, cefixime Chetan never. Bhai, he is a pneumonia, no pneumonitis. Sorry, pneumonia. Ah. Uh, so no cefixime about diaphragm. That's the. Okay. I feel uh, even I'm not okay with uh, cefodoxime. Okay. I'll be preferring uh, good old uh, augmentin. Uh, remember, ceftriaxone and augmentin, they belong to the both beta lactam group. And this switch is uh, quite okay. So Fair I'll enough. Prefer to I accept that. That's I'll, not I'll a problem. Amoxicillin is a, okay. Amoxicillin alone is quite okay. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Yes, why, sir. Can't, why can't we step down to the cefurexin? I think it, uh, it's, a, it's a very good... Uh, uh, Cef step down to which drug? Cefurexin. Cefurexin. Okay, I have not given you that option, I, but yeah, that's but a possibility. Cefuroxime, yeah. no? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, which is, now for you again, which is an example of switch therapy in this? Ceftriaxone to cefexime, ranitidine to ranitidine, tablet and oral, cefotaxime to ciprofloxacin, heparin to... Which is an example of a switch? Please vote. Excellent. So the first, can we have uh, my slide presentation again? Yeah. So the, just looking at this, ceftriaxone to cefexime, if you are treating a gram-negative infection, is a switch. The other two are what? They are step-down therapies. And the last, the, the, sorry. Sequential. Sequential therapies. And the last one, is a step-down therapy, that is heparin to warfarin. And we are now going to be discussing switch. Do you agree with this? Chetan Bhai, you want to say something? Yes, when you want to switch from IV to oral conversion, either you can have sequential, that is same uh, drug, if it is available, IV and oral, that is sequential. IV to per oral you want to do and the same drug is not available. Suppose you have given ampicillin clav uh, clavulinic and you want to go for amoxiclav, that is the switch because you have to choose the, the antibiotics from the same group with the same potency but different molecule altogether. And last is step down. Uh, you don't have that same group, then you can just step down and that is de-escalation with step down. Okay. So here it is, ceftriaxone to cefexime is a switch because it's the same group with same potency but different molecule. Which you have answered my next question. What is the advantage of switch? Uh, Dr. Arun Shah, tell me. <coughs> Advantages of uh, switch therapy is uh, uh, it is responsible for the lesser cost because we so have, cost. Uh, cost cost of the treatment is definitely one and uh, there is always a risk associated with the intravenous administration. So, so we are complications, complications of IV. Yes, IV uh, complications associated with the IV administrations. And uh, uh, these are the two, I think, uh, uh, most important uh, things. So yeah. 
yeah. I think cost, complication, convenience and drug resistance. Absolutely. And loss to the physician. True. Correct. <laughs> okay. So, what criteria should the patient fulfill before you can do a switch? The criteria before switching is that the well, patient must be stable. I mean, so, hem hemodynamic stability. Hemod yeah, hemodynamic stability. And uh, then we must be sure that there is no uh, supportive lesions. So, no pus collection anywhere yes. which will require drainage yeah. and then I, till then IV antibiotic therapy, what yeah. else? We must ensure that the patient is taking the medicines and proper compliance is very important. That, that uh, patient, uh, uh, if he goes home, he should take the medicines in time. So, compliance, that means the patient's Compliance to the medication is extremely important okay. because if he interrupts the therapy, this serious infection may lead to problems. Yes. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, the important thing that patient should have an intact GIT. Should he have should an intact GIT. GI he, tract. He Absolutely. He should be able to he take, take it orally. Over. Yeah, fair yeah, enough. That, that's it. Uh, what monitoring do I need to do? Dr. Kukreja, you've been quiet for some time. Tell us. Uh, monitoring is uh, the similar it should have been in the hospital. For example, I need to know uh, what the intake is, what is output like, like what is the temperature which the patient is recording, any new complications which appear. Or if I have to uh, do some um, investigations, for example, uh, uh, some CBC or some toxicity for the drug like uh, renal parameters and all that, all these things should be advised. Are uh, you to just shifting the patient home, but all other management remains same. Okay, fair enough. And which, yeah, Chetan, you want to add something? Most importantly, monitoring of compliance. When we have switched to IV to, IV to oral, Absolutely. we have to check on the tablets which have been given or the uh, bottle which has been given after three and, days. And I think more important than that is we should be careful in which condition we are doing a switch. So meningitis or serious bacterial infections, there is no question of switching over. Only a child who is clinically responsible. I think there are three, four conditions where the switch is absolutely not possible. You have to go on to OPAT only and that is meningitis, brain abscess and uh, condition like bacterial endocarditis. There is no way you can make a switch. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so some take home messages for this, there should be no suppurative infection, oral intake has to be maintained, they should be stable clinically, they should have a normal sensorium and patients should be afebrile for 24 hours before conversion to oral antibiotics. Uh, we go on to, and if you don't do your switch properly, you can land up into a very messy situation. Now we come to the last part of this uh, session and often we tend to act very aggressively when we see a sick child and often that is justified. Okay, so in this, in this case it was not justified but I will give you a scenario. You have a 12 month old infant who came with high grade fever, lethargy and vomiting since two days. He developed a purpuric rash on day three, sick child with a grunt, hemorrhagic rash, dusky skin, CRT was prolonged, pulses were feeble. This child was admitted in the PICU, started on oxygen, fluids and ceftriaxone. Investigations were sent and uh, so this, this showed basically a derangement in the CBC, CRP was high, the <coughs> prothrombin time was prolonged. The child went into respiratory arrest on the next day and had to be ventilated. There was no improvement in perfusion, hydration and sensorium. So in view of his deteriorating situation, Instead of only ceftriaxone, uh, fluconazole was added. Somebody started IVIG also because it was a situation where Marta kya nahi karta. You want to do maximum for this child, you don't want to lose him. The child improved on day four and the blood culture drew, drew, grew Neisseria meningitidis, which was sensitive to ceftriaxone. What would be the line of treatment for the house? The options are continue the same form of therapy that you are giving because the child has improved on this. Culture has shown a growth, so what? You are still scared, you don't want to lose the child. Continue only ceftriaxone and IVIG. Continue ceftriaxone and fluconazole. IVIG was in any case questionable. Continue only ceftriaxone and oh, I don't have any more options. So please vote now. Dr. Shah, you are going to comment on their replies. Okay. 
So D was continuous ceftriaxone track zone with fluconazole. No, that was, show me the results again, I'm sorry. There was an E which confused me. So continue only ceftriaxone. zone. The audience has, I think, uh, uh, probably <coughs> given a very, very correct answer. What do you feel, Dr. Shah? You want yeah, I think uh, uh, most, of the, most of the audience are very much uh, aware of this, that, well, uh, looking at the scenario, case scenario, this is a classical example of de-escalation when the antibiotics are not required. Like uh, antifungal drugs was given, the IV gamma globin was, uh, was given, but the culture report showed clearly the uh, uh, this, uh, Neisseria meningitis, which is sensitive to uh, ceftriaxone. So we should stick to the ceftriaxone alone, and there is no ne need to give the unnecessary uh, another antibiotic because. Uh, this will also uh, prevent the emergence of uh, bacterial resistance also by giving too many anti antibiotics or antifungal drugs. Dr. Arora, what exactly do we mean by de-escalation? What does it actually mean? It's a, it's a high-flown word which I see a lot of infectious disease specialists talking about. I get very tense. So tell us in simple language what exactly does it mean? See, normally when we get a say really serious patient suspecting a severe sepsis, so the first, our priority is to save the life of the patient. So for saving life, we may start uh, uh, drugs empirically that uh, based on the possibility, but, but once we get, once the patient's condition become a bit stabilized and laboratory reports are with us, especially the culture reports and all, then uh, based on uh, the judgment, we try to now become rational that what is needed, we are going to give that. So what we have escalated Sir, previously. I think when we started aggressive therapy also we were being rational only, no? Yeah, th yeah. That, but now, now we know what the patient has exactly and to what he has responded also. So now it's the time that we should uh, do what is actually needed. So we should uh, uh, stop all those drugs which we have started on empirical okay. basis. Absolutely. Chetan, you want to add? Yeah, I can just put it in one uh, sentence, de-escalation. It is a narrowing down of the antibiotics just to narrow down the spectrum of coverage of uh, with, with this antibiotic by either reducing the number of antibiotics. If you are giving two, three, you can come down. Looking at the blood culture and the clinical uh, condition of the patient. Both are important because if blood culture shows something and patient is improving, then also we don't go for de-escalation. But de-escalation requires these two things which is very important. Okay. Dr. Kukreja, you want to add? Depending mm -hmm. on the culture report, obviously, if the culture report indicates, uh, for example, you had given miropenem and now the culture report says it's sensitive to ceftriaxone, I'll step down to ceftriaxone and that's a real de-escalation. Absolutely. And stopping like fluconazole and others. And by the way, this patient would have needed steroids also. Absolutely, yeah. No, what I wanted to get down to, actually not discussing the management of Neisseria meningitis, I wanted to discuss about de-escalation. De so for the audience, is de-escalation required in all ICU patients? Your options are yes, if a specific pathogen is isolated, yes, only if the child is responding and a specific pathogen is isolated, no, if the child is not responding even though a specific pathogen is isolated and no, not required if the child is responding to current line of treatment. These are your four options. Please vote now. I think Chetan has leaked the answer, but uh, just to emphasize. Yes, only if the child is responding and the pathogen is identified. I think the answer is absolutely appropriate. And in which of these can de-escalation therapy be done? Antibiotics, antifungals, inotropes, and all of the above. Audience? Though this session is antibiotic therapy, I have put in some more stuff. Absolutely, all of the above, thank you. Now the messages that we want to give in, in this session are de-escalation is possible in most ICU patients, child should be improving and the organism should be identified, need to identify the most appropriate antibiotic and implement therapy based on culture reports, it's feasible even in septic shock and it prevents drug resistance. I think these are the messages we wanted to give with this and it does not influence the long term outcome.
Just one thing I, I would like to add. Yes, sir. The recent randomized control study have shown that, especially in cases of severe sepsis or ventilator associated pneumonia, the uh, there has been the cases, in fact, uh, there has been readmissions. That means ki that uh, the patients uh, after de escalations they have been they have further uh, worsened. But uh, ultimately, the, there, have, there has been no impact in mortality ultimately. So, uh, very serious patients definitely by de escalations they may, may, they may uh, worsen sometimes. But Overall, overall uh, mortality is not affected. This is the randomized control study. Chetan. Can I add? Sir, in ICU setup, there are few fundamentals which we, we consider. One is antifungals. If you suspect anti like fungal infection, you start with antifungal. And then if you don't find on culture, you just step down, you remove the antifungals. If in gram negative sepsis, if you are given two antibiotics and you get your culture gets positive and it is sensitive to one antibiotic, then you just uh, uh, de escalate to one antibiotic. For gram positive, if you are suspecting MRSA, you started with the uh, vancomycin and if it doesn't come, then also you can de escalate. And lastly, most tricky situation is patient is just stable, but there is nothing on culture and you have given broad spectrum empirical antibiotic, maybe in combination. At that time, it is very difficult that to, how can you de-escalate? That's a real critical situation. Yeah. Dr. Kukrej. a classical issue of uh, riding the tiger and doesn't know how to get down. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would like to conclude this session by a small uh, piece of writing which I have done. We were asked to debate the use of antibiotics. How can I continue if I can't read? That's cruel. Predetermined uh, to reduce misuse and practice rationalized th rational therapeutics. The aim is to reduce resistance and abuse, a reduction in cost, especially by the father, a volatile situation diffuse. By practicing deferred use of the drug, we would present, prevent unnecessary resistance in the bug. If we adopt OPAT, the hospital bill would not be fat. A rational approach to the switch will cure the illness without a glitch. This is not a single battle, but a strategic war. De-escalation conserves our weapon, leading to a victorious roar. Responsible prescribing is the need of the hour, if we want to secure our future and these bugs to overpower. Finally, I would like to say that the antibiotics are fine. It's the user that's the problem. And we have to be careful. And I hope that we will go home with this kind of a message. And I would like to thank our panelists for a lovely interaction. Thank you, Dr. Anand and all our panelists for an excellent take-home messages.